and we're finally getting to uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Last time we did the sort of the, the, the two single tunes that were kind of the warm up to it. Right. Take it. Okay, well, before we get started, one of my famed annotations, and this is something I, I meditated on and thought about uh, because I'm that much of a freak. Um, Let's, let's talk about the meaning of collaboration for a second. Because there's all this talk about, oh, the Beatles stopped collaborating when blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, they weren't collaborating as much, blah, blah, blah. Okay, the fact of the matter is they collaborated all the way through. It de but what I realize is you have to take three different definitions of collaboration and then place them, those definitions, through their history as they evolved. The first type of collaboration is face-to-face collaboration where McCartney and Lennon are sitting with each other with guitars and they're going back and forth and uh, you know McCartney says well change this chord to that and Lennon says let's change this lyric to that and so they write a song as one meld, one melded unit. The second type of collaboration is more like patchwork where McCartney's off on his own, Lennon's off on his own. You'll find this in Pepper's um, uh, In a Day in a Life. Uh, McCartney you know came in they spent weeks on A Day in a Life, and they had this middle, blank middle section, and Lennon knew that he wanted something there, but didn't know what. And McCartney says, well, I have this piece. Woke up, fell out of bed, Lennon goes, perfect. All right, so now you have the type of collaboration where they've been separate, but one is willing to accept a piece of music from the other. And you could even see some of that even in earlier years that they did that. Life is very short, and there's no time for fussing. That was Lennon. Try to see it my way is McCartney. Right, and it was two separate pieces, but it was, it was kind of like a. It, they were probably closer then, and it was probably a little bit closer to face-to-face -face collaboration. So you have face-to-face -face collaboration. You have the separate songwriters just adding parts to each other's, and then there's something that I'd like. I want to call arrangement collaboration. All right, now when you look at when we get into the far future of of the Beatles, you start looking at the White Album and things like um, Abbey Road. And what happens there is, now they're really separate, you know, McCartney's doing his thing, Lennon's doing his thing, but they still come together as a band in the studio, and Lennon might say, hey, you know, this backup vocal needs this. Okay. And this, we're talking about the actual arrangement of the song. Well, why don't we stick the chorus? Why don't you do two verses before we go to the chorus? That sort of thing. Okay. So there's still input, and there's still respect. And one thing I, I keep hearing repeatedly on that um, documentary I mentioned, composing the Beatles songbook, is they were constantly looking over each other's shoulders. Even though they were separating spiritually, they were constantly checking each other out to see uh, what is he up to. Oh. So there are three types, again, three types of collaboration. Face-to-face, -face, patchwork, where they just kind of stick pieces mm -hmm. together, and finally arrangement collaboration. They collaborated all the way through. There wasn't a loss of collaboration. Okay, uh, the third one, how how much input did outside people have with arrangement? Like, they w did they have someone else figure out strings? Uh, all right, uh, strings, uh, that's a good question. I, you know, McCartney might get the notion, like for example, She's Leaving Home off of Pepper. So you've got strings on there. By the way, not arranged by Martin. We'll talk about that later. Okay. A different producer did that. But he thought, you know, I need some strings on here. Martin was out of town. He was doing another project, calls it another producer that guy puts in the strings. Maybe McCartney hums the melody to the guy because he can't write music down on right. paper. So you get that, you know. Um, other collaborations, are, are like from the outside that you're talking about, are the influences. Like for example, uh, the song Hard Day's Night, the song Tomorrow Never Knows, right? Those are both uh, malapropisms that Ringo w came up with. Okay. He would just say that, oh, it's been a hard day's night, or and Lennon <laughs> loved it. He loved the turn of a phrase. Sure. And also, tomorrow, you know, Ringo, oh, tomorrow never knows. Like, don't worry about the future. Lennon didn't have a title for um, tomorrow never knows. I mean, he just loved the way that sounded and threw it on there. Does he then put it, like a typical songwriter, put it into the chorus, put that actual line into the chorus, the title? Uh, well, not in Tomorrow Never Knows. He, okay. he never uses that phrase. But oh, in Hard Day's Night, it's the, it's the hook, right? Yeah, the, right, right, right. Okay. Right? So, uh, uh, also, here, a little bit while we're on Peppers, you know, there was the, the opening introductory song, uh, uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Well, when they were piecing, when they were mastering the record, meaning doing the final, like, order of the songs, and, you know, there's a way 
that you work with technical devices like compressors and stuff like that. One, one, all right, just a side note, one bane of the existence of, of uh, musicians is, is like, for example, my jam band. Uh, we'll, we'll make a disc and I'll, we'll play it on the car stereo. It sounds great on the car stereo, but then you take it home and it sounds awful on the home system. Mm -hmm. Mastering is about equalizing everything across all systems, so it sounds great on the radio, on your car, it sounds great on the home stereo, it sounds great in an iPod, all that sort of thing. That's what mastering is about. So, uh, why did I get onto mastering? I just uh, I just went off on that, but um, oh well, okay. in the studio you're talking about you know when you're at that point. All right, they're at that point, and they're they're ordering the songs as part of mastering too. And by the way, guys that do mastering for a living makes tons of bucks. You, you do like an hour session mastering that you, you spend like three hundred bucks. Oh really? You know? okay. Yeah. Uh, so they make lawyers' wages. Yeah. You know. Um, anyway, when they're in the mastering process, they're trying to figure like. What can come right before a day in a life, right after Good Morning, Good Morning? And uh, I think it was, I'm pretty sure it's, that's the order of day in a life. Um, yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, they didn't know what to, to, to do there. It wasn't like Good Morning, Good Morning wasn't flowing into a day in a life. And Jeff Emmerich, their engineer, said, well, why don't you take that Sgt. Pepper song you did and use it, like, do a reprise? You know, for like the end of the show. Yeah. And and you know, Day in a Life will be the encore. And they just loved the idea. They just immediately loved it. And McCartney went in, did a few tweaks. Like the second version is not the same as the first. There's some tweaks. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a little modulation in there. Some cool stuff going on. So uh, there's another outside influence. The Jeff Emmerich, the engineer, just had a suggestion. They went for it. What about all these? You know, not just in this album, but what about sort of those odd sounds? I mean, the, the equivalent of putting a theremin, you know, in the Beach Boys, right, too, right. this sort of thing. Yeah. Um, who, who, who would come up with those? And then who would actually do those sounds? Wait, who would come up with the effects concepts? Yeah. Well, yeah. All right, well, there's, there's a lot of influence there because, first of all, even on Peppers, you have Harrison still playing with that Stratocaster and getting some immense guitar tones out of that. Uh, lead guitar solo, solo to Fixing a Hole is a great example of, wow, what a tone, what a great, oh. cool tone. Um, I don't know how to get that tone, no no idea. Like I sit there with a digital box and tweak things and it doesn't happen. You okay. know. One day, one day. But um, besides, I get my own tone, so. Yeah. Um, we call it VIN tone. But then you have M McCartney's experiment with experimentation with tape loops, right? And Lennon had an obsession with tweaking his vocal, doing anything to make his vocal sound different than it sounds. Lennon did effects like, uh, I don't know if it was for I'm Only Sleeping, but it'd be appropriate, where he laid on his back and sang kind of in a breathy voice to get a different tone. Uh, all these things, like in the 80s, still all of these like weird approaches to like what would happen if, you know, we stuck the microphone in a garbage can and you sang into the garbage can. What would that sound like? Oh, okay. Right? All these kinds of experiments went on through the 80s, and I remember when I was recording my own session, uh, an 8-track session of my pop songs, uh, you know, we were doing stuff like that. Oh, like, okay. well, what if we did this, you know, what if we turned the amp, you know, toward the wall and... The equivalent of, let's record this in the bathroom. Yeah, yeah. The vocals. Which, by the way, Led Zeppelin, that's how they got their drum song. You know, is they, that right? Yeah, the, uh, their drum sounds. I mean, uh, they, they... I don't know if it was in the bathroom, but they mm -hmm. found, like, a really ceramic room oh, in, in Page's house, and it was the sound. You know, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, man. So. Um, let, let me see. Was there something else I was going to ask? I forget. Uh, it'll come up, I'm sure. So I wanted to say that about collaboration. Um, and also, by the way, I think it was on that documentary, some, some fellow was commenting on uh, Beatles collaboration, and he had the argument that they also collaborated all the way through. Except he was more of the school of thought that said, no, it was still face-to-face -face collaboration. They were still oh. doing that. I'm not so sure I buy that. I think it was in those three different sections I was talking yeah. about. There might have been the rare moment where they sat down together in the later years. Mm -hmm. but and, and You know, the strange thing is, I think Lennon would have liked that, would have liked them sitting down together. Because um, here's the deal. Like, you know, one thing, you have to have some historical backdrop. There weren't four Beatles. There were like six of them if not seven or eight of them. I mean, when you think about their engineer, Jeff Emmerich, when you think about um, 
George Martin's production. Right. When you think about even Brian Epstein, their manager, okay? The, Brian Epstein was kind of like, he mothered the Beatles, and he, he, he was the guy that told them, look, you know, the, the long hair is fine as long as you keep it trimmed nicely, it looks clean, and wear jackets. Look like gentlemen when you go out to play. Don't wear those leather jackets looking like street kids, right? No, the, the German, when they play that yeah. joint in Germany. Yeah. Right, right, you know, the, the, what was it, the cavern. You yeah. Know? And that, that is a historical place, I mean, in terms of like, if they didn't get that gig, and, and if they weren't working for 10 hours a day, they wouldn't achieve, have achieved the level of performance perfection they achieved. You can look at old live performances of the Beatles, like on Ed Sullivan and stuff mm -hmm. like this. Live performance, and the harmony, it's, it sounds like a recording. Well, why? That's how they recorded, live. Oh. You know, they were a band, they put some mics out there, and boom. Things are changing by now. You know, we have four-track recording now, and Sgt. Right. Peppers, you know. So... Uh, Oh, here, I just remembered the thing. Uh, in an interview with Dick Cavett, Lennon uh, very much downplayed his ability to play guitar. I think I think Cavett wanted to pick up a guitar from right in the back of the chair or something and have him play or something like that, which I think he maybe eventually did, I think, in that interview. But he, he very, very much uh, uh, downplayed the idea that he was a good guitarist. Did he have the same, is some of this experimentation, experimentation with vocals? Did he ever have uh, have some in insecurity about his voice? And maybe as over against McCartney, who had that high, that you know, schoolboy, yeah, clear yeah. voice, that sort of thing. I think Lennon must have noticed that McCartney was like getting better and better as a vocalist. You know, McCartney was oddly humble in the early Beatles, and in fact, there's a kind of you know, with all of their later years strutting and stuff like that, there's a wonderful phenomenon in this early rock and roll. This was the day before guitar players were competing with each other, like for some Olympic gold medal, like who could play the fastest or the most impressive. Yeah. It was only until bands like Cream and Jimi Hendrix came to the fore that, oh, the guitar player is now you know, God. An, an Olympic sport. You yeah. Know, the guitar is, yeah, right. So uh, the interesting thing is, like in the Beatles, they very often switched roles. You know, Harrison stepped out and let McCartney play the solo on... Uh, on quite a few tunes, like Taxman, that was Harrison's tune, McCartney played the solo. Oh, is that, oh, okay. You know, are we getting good video here? Yeah, I think we are. Yeah, I think we are. When I right. do demonstrations on the guitar, I want to make sure you yeah. know, it's viewable. Um, <clears throat> yeah, what, where, what were we just on? Um, 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 uh, are we having the, a the, mutual the, senior moment here? Yeah, I think the, the guitar gods, the, the right. moving into guitar gods sort of thing. But yeah. in the early days, he was uh, McCartney humble. There we are. Yeah, and actually all the Beatles were kind of humble. They weren't in competition in terms of, like, musicianship. Uh -huh. You know, maybe later on. McCartney, when he had his whatever he had, became a jack-of-all-trades. But, I mean, bottom line is, no, Lennon wasn't much of a all-around instrumentalist. Guitar, piano, whatever. He wasn't, he wasn't great. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's very common to great songwriters. They're usually really bad singers and really bad musicians and really bad players. It's very common. Bert Bacharach is a horrible singer, great songwriter. Yeah, you know. there we go. Okay. Um, you know, you know, it's a lucky combination to get someone like Elvis Costello, who's not only a great songwriter, but a great singer, you know. Yeah. Um, he, however, I don't think is a terrific instrumentalist. No, there you go again. No, no. You know, yeah. And McCartney was clever, and like, you know, Martha, my dear, to play on piano is no easy feat. You have to be a piano player to play that. Oh, really? You know, I've tried it. It took a long, long time for me to figure out now it's all forgotten, but, you know, it's difficult. Do you think he was the kind of guy that just kept at it until he had it, or that he did kind of have a gift to pick it up quick? He, he had a gift. He yeah. really was gifted as a musician. I mean, they were playing keyboards early on, both of them. Oh, know, okay. Both of them. Um, but McCartney, you know, me being a guitar player, I have to say that George was the guitarist in the band. I mean, when you think about it, I mean, really George was the guy who, um, that was his focus. Like, if you look at uh, Till There Was You in the early live performance, right, um, he does this whole jazz thing on the guitar that really impressed me. He was using some, like, intense jazz changes, uh, that sort of thing. Which this is a a C seven a C thirteen flat nine chord, right? Yeah. And 
And so where did he pick that up? Well, he was he was digging around, you know. Huh. So so when I hear McCartney play lead guitar, it often sounds wimpy to me. Harrison knew how to get the edge on a guitar and make it sound pretty masculine and aggressive. He was listening to people like Eric Clapton, right. you know, who were great, great guitar players and Hendrix, people like that. You know. Sure. So anyway, uh, who, getting who on... Would, well, while we're on that subject, who are the other... Who are the other guitarists that, that, that Harrison or that the Beatles would look at for their guitar playing? Clapton? Uh, 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 where, where were we in the... Oh, was Hendrix on there? Uh, yeah, Hendrix must have impressed them pretty much, okay. especially Harrison, because since he was a guitar player. Right. You know. Uh, who were the other English guys? I mean, was... I, I'm losing track of who won the Moody Blues. Uh, uh, what was Zeppelin later? Was uh, yeah, that was Zeppelin was later. Okay. Yeah. It was really Clapton and Hendrix that came to the forefront, like in the late sixties, bringing, you know, blues guitar, taking blues guitar, playing it through a stack of Marshalls, set, setting the volume on eleven, maybe uh -huh. twelve, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, just you know that getting that arena rock sound. Uh, you know, power trio, what's called the power trio, right. which consists of guitar, bass, drums. Beatles were two guitar, bass, drums, different kind of setup. So, uh, yeah, th when these guys started to make their noise, the Beatles were coming close to their end by this, you know, right. time. But uh, they were starting to recognize there is such thing as hard rock, and they tried to emulate it, but I, they were very wimpy. Like, when they tried to do hard rock, it just sounded kind of, oh. you know, they were too pop. They They had too much of a... A more delicate sensibility to really even even a song like uh, uh, what's McCartney's song? Uh, uh, forever, I'll never see you again. Yeah, yeah. Do you? Don't you want me to love you? Uh, the the song that Manson killed by. <laughs> Uh, Helter Skelter. Helter Skelter. Yeah. Helter Skelter. Uh, that's that song. Even doesn't come like if if Zeppelin had done a song like that, it would have really kicked people's oh. asses. But there's kind of a wimpy quality to the Beatles when they try to do that really over the top oh. rock stuff. They, well, they yeah. actually were more choir boy than they probably thought they were. <laughs> Lennon Lennon claimed that uh, uh, this. Uh, Mm. Ticket to Ride was, he claims it was the first heavy metal song. And I'm, what? <laughs> I mean, yeah, one thing that happened, the drums are really big. It was new. I mean, there's definitely newness to the whole thing, but it was certainly not heavy metal. Yeah. Not even nearly, it was too intelligent. I mean, a lot of heavy metal was really dumb. <laughs> it may, may not have been heavy folk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Loving all the ambient noise, it's wonderful. Yeah, uh, well, you know you're in a city. Well, I could close the windows and freeze the, the blinds. We're in lovely Venice Beach, California. That's by right, the way. yeah. We are only a block from the sand before the ocean. You can almost see Tokyo on a good day. And uh, very close to the uh, hotel that uh, Jim Morrison stayed in. I just watched the Doors movie recently. Oh, man. It's historic and hysteric. Yeah, I used to joke with this friend of mine because the doors are so sacred out here in California. And it's like, you know, like if you're on the East Coast in Jersey and you diss Bruce Springsteen, he's yeah. the boss. You don't say that stuff, you know. And out here it's Jim Morrison. And uh, I've always thought, like, I used to joke with this buddy of mine that he's the world's worst American poet. He's just the worst <laughs> American poet that ever was. You know, this lizard stuff. Come on, dude. <laughs> but actually, after watching the Doors movie, I gained a new respect for him and what he was doing. There, there was a sort of depth to what he was doing. It was very interesting. Live fast, die young. All right, so now here, 